All right, everybody ready to get started back? First of all, does anybody have a question? We're going to move on to a different topic. Um, does anybody have questions on what we've already talked about? Yes, sir. If it involves persimmons... What's all the good uses for mullen? Mullen? Uh, mullen is one... Yep, one of the best lung herbs. Uh, it's very good for inflammation all over the body, uh, especially in uh, like the digestive and bladder. If you have a bladder issue uh, with uh, debris or inflammation in the bladder and in the kidneys, you can take it for that. The root is very good for inflammation in the bones and joints and deep tissues. So I make a salve with mullen root. You listening to me? <laughs> she's, she's asked me twice about inflammation, so I'm just teasing you there. Uh, but the root is very good as a salve for inflammation, and I will put it with poke root. Poke root. And no, it will not jump out and grab your children. I'm going to talk about poke too. Can you use the leaf while it's green, or do you have to Yes. Uh, you can use it fresh. Uh, I prefer to dry it. Have you ever heard it called cowboy toilet paper? Okay, there's a lot of people will call it cowboy toilet paper, but I would bet you money they've never used it because it has those fine hairs on it. <laughs> and that's some pretty delicate tissue to get fine hairs stuck, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, uh, but the leaves, yes, you can use the leaves fresh. They're very easy to dry. If you're gonna dry your mullen leaf, take a pair of scissors or a knife and cut out the vein. They'll, it'll dry much more evenly because that vein is thick and it has the moisture in it and it won't dry nearly as well as the leaf itself. So just cut those veins out <clears throat> or tear it off. You can tear it right off of the, the um, you can tear it right off of the, the vein, the, the stem. Uh, and then when you dig your, your root, just wash it and take off the the, um, the root and I just chop those up and put them in an oil and let them sit. I prefer heat so I'll put it in a um, in a crock pot. If I put it in the jar, sit the jar, I'm not going to make that much, you know, maybe like a pint. I'll put some oil in there and put a couple of roots in it and sit it inside the crock pot and put about three inches of water in the crock pot turn it on high and let it get to a boiling where you see the oil almost boil and then turn that heat down to low and let it simmer overnight or several hours just make sure that the water doesn't evaporate depends on what I'm doing if it's for if it's for a, a skin issue uh, sunflower oil olive oil um, avocado oil, shea butter, coconut oil, anything like that will do. If it's for a deep tissue issue, castor oil, hands down. And the only thing better than castor oil is bear fat. Bear fat. Bear. Fat. bear. Rawr. Rawr. Grizzly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do. If I can get bear fat, bear fat, if you have to buy bear fat, it's about $25 an ounce. So I don't, the only bear fat I will use is a hunter that lives near me that was throwing away his, oil, his bear fat. And I'm like, can I have it please? I didn't even get any this year. Last year I got a bunch and then they found out somehow, found out how expensive it is to buy it. Nobody wants to get rid of it. Now they'll, they'll kill about 20 bear a year. And so a castor oil would be good for a skin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Castor oil, you can use yeah. poultices, uh, of, um, not poultices, excuse me, compresses. The difference in a compress and a poultice is the compress is with a cloth, but a poultice is the, a gob of the material. As my grandmother would say, just grab a gob of, of what you've been macerating in the water or the oil and put it on your skin. Yes, I would put it with something else. I would put it with whatever oil. On my, I'm very sensitive, as you can see. Here lately, I can't even wear makeup on my face without it burning. So I have a, and yesterday I was out, at, believe it or not, there was really sunny yesterday. Uh, so I was out a lot in the sun and, and got some sunburn. Um, but castor oil, I wouldn't put it straight on my face. And I'll use almond or 
um, palm kernel, uh, uh, yeah, um, sustainable palm. I'm sorry, what? I don't use aloe vera. That's just me because it, it's, uh, it doesn't do well on my skin. However, if you're using aloe vera, um, yeah, you can put that with your oil, blend it up so that it'll, it'll um, go together. Uh, but um, apricot kernel is very good. I can use it on my skin. Rose oil is another one. Evening primrose oil is very good for skin. And evening primrose, sun drops evening primrose, grows everywhere here. Get to know that plant. Find it when it's harvest or when it's time to get the seeds and infuse your oil. Grind those seeds up in your oil. It's very good for your skin, very good for women. <clears throat> no, um, sun drops evening primrose will be a tall plant and it has a bright sunny yellow flower. Onethera, O-E-N-E-T-H-E-R-A, it's in that family, um, but you can find it, it grows everywhere. It's, it's not an invasive, but it's very prolific. So when you're doing it with the castor oil, are you heating up the, the castor oil and putting the herbs into it, or do you mm -hmm. just put it in cold oil? Just put it in, put, put your castor oil in your jar, put your herb in there and sit it in the water and let it heat up. You don't have to have it preheated. Oh, yeah. Well, whatever it takes to get the oil to where it's very hot, almost boiling, or the water almost boils, and then turn it down. The water? Also, you put water, you're heating the oil up in the water. Yeah, put your oil in the, in the jar with your herb, sit the, sit the jar in your crock pot, put about three inches of water, or, or about halfway up the jar, and don't put the lid on your crock pot. Turn it on high, let it heat up, to where it's almost boiling, or even boiling is fine, and then turn it down and let that let it go at that point on low for several hours, six, eight overnight. Yeah. Kind of like a double boiler. Um. Yeah. Kind of like a double boiler. Now, water is outside that can be boiled. That's that's when you'll turn it down to low once it gets to that that degree. Yeah. Yeah, you'll filter it out just like you would with the tea. Yeah. I'm hmm? actually concerned because some of this, the crop pot stays so hot. Does that, when it gets above 115, does it kill any enzymes that are good to have? Mm -hmm. No, in the old days they would fry herbs. And my mentor still does that. He makes something called Bass Sav, B A S S. Uh, my, my mentor is Daryl Patton. <clears throat> you may have heard from him. He's pretty, pretty famous. He's like a big deal. And I tell him that you're like a big deal in the herbal world. You know that, right? Patton, P-A-T-T-O-N. P -A -T -T -O -N. Uh, he's my mentor. I've been going to him for about four or five years. I've done this for like 20 years, but the last four or five years I have learned so much because this man knows thousands of plants, thousands of plants, and has a library of about 3,000 eclectic herbal books. Wow. He's just got so much information. But he will make bath salve, and he f makes it in a turkey fryer, five gallons at a time in a turkey fryer, and he'll stick one herb in and fry it till it's crispy, stick another herb in, fry it till it's crispy, take it out, stick another one in and fry it till it's crispy. And people will say, you can't fry herbs. You're going to kill it. You're going to mess up your oil. No, you're not. That's the most potent oil is if it's fried. However, if you burn it, <laughs> you have burned oil. So, you know, you have to know, you have to watch it and you don't leave it. Yes, ma'am. That's a folk method. Some people will heat it up. That's a heated method with so, the ratio. So then, which, which one's better? <clears throat> Almost every herb I'll heat. I use heat with. Even the ones that other people will say, no, you don't use heat with that. <clears throat> uh, my method and the way I teach that you have the choice whether to do or not is I put heat with almost everything because it does make a more potent tincture. 
and that's the tincture. Teas, obviously, unless you're going to make a cold tea. Mimosa, does anybody know, everybody know what mimosa is? The, tr the pink tree, pink cloud tree. This is about to start blooming here very shortly. Wonderful for uplift. I use that in a grief formula. That's one of the few, lemon balm and that one, uh, and oddly enough, they're both nervines that I will use in cold, as a cold infusion. Meaning I don't heat, don't boil for a tea or simmer for a tea. I just put leaves in cold water or flowers in cold water. And you can take and dry those flowers, dry the leaves. The bark is more potent, but don't worry about that. You're going to get plenty with the leaf or the flower. And it's very uplifting. I put it in my grief formula. And I'm very, very animated sometimes, as y'all have probably seen me over here doing stuff. But it, to me, when you use mimosa, it just makes you, okay, I can go forward. You know, it just makes you be able to just take that deep breath and relax a little bit. But... You feel better, it's not relaxing. Nervines can go two ways. They're either stimulant or relaxant. Most people think about nervines as being relaxant, but there are stimulants that are uplifting or energizing. So nervine doesn't mean sleep. Nervine means that it deals with the nervous system. <clears throat> Did I answer your question? <laughs> Did I get off on a tangent there? Did I get you? Okay, okay. All right, okay. So uh, that was mimosa. There's another one to look for. Get the flowers, dry those, try it first before you give it to somebody else, especially children, because I can put two little leaflets in a bottle of water like this and let it sit for 30 minutes, and that's all I need. I have put a half a cup full of flowers in somebody's tea, and they said they couldn't feel it. So it works very well, I think, uh, and it's very uplifting. It's slightly energizing. Um, so that's what I find that most people that are dealing with grief, they need along with Hawthorne. Uh, so I have those two as part of my grief formula. And I sell a good bit of that because it's amazing how many people are going through some sort of grief, PTSD has a grief process as, as well, getting over a PTSD. You go through that grief of the, of the trauma. Is Hawthorne is good for grief as well? Hawthorne is good for circulatory. Oh. And anything dealing with the heart, that would be the tightness in the chest from grief or stress or anxiety, anything that just grips. It just kind of opens up and makes you take a deep breath. Even if it's physical, cardiac, which would be circulatory, um, blood pressure, you know, um, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, it does, it does um, level that out. Um, but Hawthorne is very good for that, in addition with the mimosa for uplift or, or anything related to that grief process. Uh, but Hawthorne itself, very good for blood pressure, doesn't necessarily mean that's, that's a blood, lower, blood pressure lowering effect, it's an androgenic effect, meaning it's going to level it out. <clears throat> any part of hawthorn I can get I will use the berry I'll use the flower I use the leaf uh, the bark is very good when I can find a branch that I can cut off or like a water spout everybody know what a water spout is if you look at a tree and it's got that odd branch going up like that especially on apple trees or fruit trees it'll just send that odd little cut those off take that bark so I, I want on most on many things, I should say, I want whole plant medicine. So if the root is not toxic, if the berry is not toxic, if the flower is not toxic, and, and this is a, a plant by plant case, I can't just go through and say, all of these you can use the whole plant. Um, if I can't on a hawthorn specifically, I will use the whole plant. Uh, mints, anything in the Lamiaceae family, like sage, oregano, mint, I'll use all tops, skull cap, I'll use all tops. So I'll just cut the whole plant, take the stem and everything, flower, stem, leaf, I'll take the whole thing. Some things like a, um, like black locust, that's the, it's toxic except for the, the flower. Uh, the flower is very edible. The flower looks like white wisteria. And it, we just passed that season, so, <clears throat> You, you know, you may find one here or there, and you can eat those flowers. I don't use them for medicine, but they're just a delicious flower. 
It's quite edible. On that same token, the only thing that's edible on a honey locust, and the honey locust, both of these locusts will have thorns. A black locust will have smaller thorns, but a honey locust will have these gnarly things that look like from the devil. You know, they're just gnarled, uh, long thorns, gnarled up thorns on the on the trunk. Uh, look them up, and you can see them on the honey locust. The only thing that's edible is the pod. The pods will be about that long and it tastes like cacao. Mm. So that's my chocolate. It's actually akin to the uh, coffee tree or cacao tree. Mm. So did you have a question? Uh, honeysuckle, can you use any? Honeysuckle is highly antiviral. The, the flower, I put it in a trifecta uh, of honeysuckle blossom with just a few tips. And if you're pulling up honeysuckle, get the roots chop those roots up and put in it as well. Wash them off and put the roots in it as well. Honeysuckle, forsythia, the same with that. That would be the flowers, the, just a few tips, and any root that you pull up. Honeysuckle blossoms, forsythia blossoms, and the scourge of the forest, which is the sweet gum. The balls, the scourge of the forest, the sweet gum tree. The balls on the sweet gum. Those things that everybody hates in their yard and they'll wind up cutting down their, their sweet gum trees because it makes those spiky little balls. Oh, yeah. Why does that spiky little ball look like? Who <laughs> 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 said it? Looks like the coronavirus. Imagine that. Imagine that. We had the, we, I'm not going to say cure. I'm not going to say cure. <laughs> we had a remedy for the coronavirus for a specific flu we just got over right here in our backyard. So are you using it green? Or are you using, using it green. green. The seed is specifically the part that you want. However, because I'm, I'm a, a fictionado for whole plant medicine, I want the balls, the, the spiky green balls, before the eyes open. Now, let me explain what that means. That's my grandmother's term. If you look at the brown spiky thing, it looks like there's holes in it. That's a pod and it has released the seed. But while it's green, it's gonna be heavy and solid because it's got a lot of liquid in it. You want that liquid, you want the seed, specifically the immature seed. Now, having said that, if you get the brown balls and they've just fallen and you can shake out those seeds, the seed is the part that's most potent. So don't pass up that brown seed if that's all you get. If you get to the tree after the green balls have fallen and they've turned brown, get those, um, get those seeds or find a sapling and get the bark. So you're making a tea out of it? No, no, you're making a tincture out of all three of these. The honeysuckle, the forsythia, and the, um, the sweet gum. And I would put white pine in that. This, this medicine takes you a year to make. Did I say medicine? Oops. Uh, this remedy makes you, takes a year because a forsythia comes first. Do what? <laughs> the, the forsythia comes first. The honeysuckle comes in the summer. The green balls are about August, September. And then the white pine is in the winter. Yeah, did you have a question? My mentors always told me not, not to say cure, say prevent and reverse disease. Exactly. Yeah, the reason you can't say cure is because the FDA will, will, is breathing down our necks. Anybody here with the FDA? I'm checking again. It's like the police. You have to say, all right, you have to say if you're with the FDA. I don't know. I just don't know. What was the honeysuckle? What did it do for you? Uh, honeysuckle is highly antiviral. Mm -hmm. So the order was, was uh, forsythia, honeysuckle, sweet gum, and... White pine. And why white pine? White pine has shikimic acid. Now, let's talk about shikimic acid. I said I was going to talk about inflammation, and I promise you I will get to inflammation. Shikimic acid. Um, who has taken uh, Tamiflu? Has anybody ever heard of Tamiflu? You may not have taken it, but everybody knows what Tamiflu is. Uh, for the flu, do what? Oh, no, I said oh. I give it all the time. Oh, okay. Um, Tamiflu... The, the main ingredient in Tamiflu is shikimic acid. Mm -hmm. Shikimic acid 
uh, was the derivative, they've taken it out of its natural form and put it to make Tamiflu. There was a lot of people having problems with Tamiflu because they isolated one constituent, took it out of its natural form, and put it, made it into Tamiflu. And that's a chemical process to do that. Usually when that happens, there's going to be a problem somewhere. <laughs> you can get that shikimic acid from star anise. Does everybody know what star anise is? It's that spice that looks like a little star. It's about this big. And uh, with the pod, what they do is slice the pod or, or the pod just opens. And anyway, it looks like a, a star. Uh, you can find it, and that's the reason it's called star anise. It smells like licorice. <clears throat> That's the number one source of shikimic acid. Uh, it's about 11%, maybe 20%, I don't remember what the number is. The second best source is sweet gum. Um, when there was a shortage of Tamiflu a few years ago, five or six, seven years ago, that's when there were, may, maybe longer than that. You remember the, the big earthquake in China? That's when there was... Um, they, they, it demolished several of the star anise farms and so we had a shortage of Tamiflu because we couldn't get it. And that was the main source because the star anise grew in China, India and a couple of other places like that. So when we had that large earthquake it caused the problem uh, for the supply chain. But the second best source is right in our backyard and that's the uh, sweet gum. So when you're putting shikimic acid Shikimic acid is a bio, big word, biofilm disruptor. That means it's going to stop the replication of the virus. White pine has shikimic acid as well. So when you're using white pine, that white pine tea for your vitamin C, you're also using a preventive, uh, not a preventative. That's a, that's a pet peeve of my mentor to say preventative. So we do it just to, you know, just to make him mad and then regret it. <laughs> but a preventive... Uh, is the white pine. You can take that every single day. Who takes elderberry? Elderberry, every single day, I'm sorry, you didn't have to raise your hand, I'm <laughs> pointing you out. Um, taking elderberry every, every single day can cause you problems. There's about a hundred issues, medical issues with elderberry every year because people use it incorrectly. Number one is if you take it every single day, your immune system can become dependent on it. Uh, you don't want to take it every single day. You want to take breaks. Take it five days, off two, take it a week, off a week, take it three weeks, off three weeks, something like that. Uh, so you'll want to take a break if you're using elderberry because your system won't function on its own as well as if it were take getting breaks. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So yes. On this treatment, well, it's the wrong term to use, but when folks were having the active virus, whatever variation, how were they given this combination of? Was this something that they took by mouth? Uh, you talking about the forsythia and? You can, oh, well, that's a good question. Let, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. When you're dealing with certain systems in the body, um, a hollow organ, hollow systems, hollow organs, you need to flood that system. If it's a bladder, your bladder's hollow, right? Tea is going to work better than just a, just a tincture. So you'll, if you're going to use a tincture, that's perfectly fine. Just put it in a full glass of water and drink it. If you're, gonna, if you're working on something for your bladder, drink tea instead of just one dropper of tincture um, because your system needs to be flooded. Kidneys, stomach, digestion, colon, all of these things that are hollow, lungs. Does that mean you're going to try to try to pour tea down your throat in, into your lungs? No, but the same principle still applies. Taking the tea is going to help your lungs better or putting a tincture into water will help better. There are certain herbs like, for example, um, goldenrod. Goldenrod is a wonderful, a lot of people think they're allergic to goldenrod. 99 times out of 100 you will not be allergic to goldenrod. It's the ragweed that's blooming at the same time, but goldenrod is very showy. It's out there. Here I am. It's, it's summer. Look at me. 
That's what people think they're allergic to. Goldenrod is actually a decongestant and it has antihistamine properties. That means it's going to help your body deal with those allergies and the symptoms of the allergy. Had a lady Friday, she was just, oh, she was just horribly sneezing, runny nose, congested. She was just coughing terribly. And it just started when she got to my house. My house is surrounded by privet. So I had a feeling the privet blooming is what was causing her problems. And I said, I'll be right back. Hank, go get, <laughs> I had Hank go get a bottle out of my shop of, of uh, what I call allergy aid. And it has the number one ingredient in it is goldenrod. Not golden seal, goldenrod. Everybody knows what goldenrod is, right? The yellow uh, flower that blooms in the middle, middle of summer. Um, it's beautiful. It's actually pollinated by insects, not wind pollinated. So for you to be allergic to goldenrod, you're pretty much going to have to get a snoot full of it like that and snort it to get it up into your nose because it's not wind pollinated. But it's one of the best antihistamines I have, I have in my arsenal. So I gave her, I said, take this now. Take, she took about a quarter drop. I said, take more in about 15 minutes. Well, we started walking around for a plant walk, and she mentioned it. She said, I think that helped a lot. I said, I'd go ahead and take another dose. I'm not supposed to say dose. I'd not take it another time. And so she took the same amount in a little bit of water, just a sip of water, because uh, none of them taste all that good. But it completely cleared her up. So that same medicine, that same herb, could be used for uh, sinuses, which are hollow. It could be used for bladder, which is hollow. She put it in water and drank it. So, um, yes. Is there any of those sublingually? Uh, I prefer buccal instead of lingual, sublingual, which is on the cheek. Yeah. Um, you can, the taste is not very good. That's why I tell people to put almost all of the tinctures in a little bit of water, especially if you're giving it to children. Just don't put it in acidic juice, like an orange juice, because you don't want, you don't want to do that. Did you have a question? Are you, are you familiar with the Shigamix pathways? Mm -hmm. Okay, so is that related to the sinus Shigamix acid? Like, could that be a, a something you could use to heal that? Because my understanding is life is a I use white oak, excuse me, white pine for a lot of things, and the shikimic pathway is one of those. So yes, I would say yes. I'm not going to say it would cure it, but it would certainly ease it. The star anise and the sweet gum? Sweet gum and, and white pine. Yeah. Uh, Sweet gum especially uh, would be good for that, um, but for some reason I'm just drawn more to white pine. A lot of times I have to just follow my heart, even though my brain is saying, well, the sweet gum is going to be, have more in it, but white pine you're going to take every day. Almost every herb is better taken multiple times instead of one big dose. So if you're drinking a quart of white pine tea a day, you're going to keep getting that every sip. You're, every time you sip it, you're going to get more. So it's going to help the issue more than if you just took that in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Does that make sense? So I'm drawn more to white pine for that than I would be to the sweet oak. So I mean, the, uh, glyphosate is probably on most everything <clears throat> you consume, then that would probably be a good thing to just have daily. Yeah, glyphosate is in our water. Glyphosate. Glyphosate is everywhere. It's just so hard to avoid it. And even if you're eating only your own food, if you're getting water in any natural source, the chances of it not having some runoff in it is really low. So taking care of your liver, um, detoxing your liver, and that doesn't mean purge. If you're taking a detox and it makes you purge and you can't le hardly leave the bathroom, that's not the best way to do it. The best way is a, a slow uh, uh, checking on your liver, or, or not checking on your liver, but um, taking care of your liver because it's the master organ. Everything is involved in the liver. So everything will, will stem from there. Yeah. They say the shikimic pathway is not in humans, it's just in plants and bacteria. So what you're saying is it affects, it helps your gut bacteria through 
help the chicken egg pathway be restored. Helps that. It's blocking that in the plant, mm -hmm. the glyphosate. Glyphosate, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, that's why they got away with what they did for so long because they said that humans don't have it, but we have it in our gut. Bacteria is in our gut. Yeah, you're so taking it. We're helping our gut bacteria by taking the, the white pine. Mm -hmm. There's so many things in each herb. You can talk about one constituent, but when there's 70 constituents in an herb, you know, or 40 constituents, or even 20 constituents, it's hard to talk about them all, but you can talk about what that plant will do. And, and you know, someone that's not familiar with something like the shikimic pathway wouldn't follow along until they study it themselves. But you can say, if you use this herb, it helps this, or it'll help that, or it'll help this, it's a little more relatable. So I don't really talk about the shikimic pathway that much simply because I don't know, not everybody has a medical background <clears throat> or if you've studied it. If you've, st if you've studied it, great. I'll, I'll be glad to talk about it, but you know what I mean. So, all right, so, yes. What do you use for a liver detox? Liver health, <coughs> the three herbs that are right here in our front yard, backyard, garden, and is a scourge for a lot of people, dandelion root, um, burdock root specifically, although the whole plant is edible in its, in its own way, in its own stage. Uh, if you get a burdock stalk and, and cut it down before it flowers, uh, cut it and peel it, it's like celery. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, burdock, uh, dandelion, and yellow dock. Yellow dock as opposed to broadleaf dock. Wonder what the difference is. Broadleaf dock has a broad leaf. Yellow dock or curly dock, it's also called curly dock, has a thin curly leaf. So the edge of that leaf is going to be just curly, 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 curly. Looks like, you know. To uh, can you comment on the four herbs that they use for SCFT? Yes, give me just a minute. Remind me of that just a second. Did you have a question? Dandelion uh, um, tea, can you drink that all as much as you want? Um, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere that couldn't, but I would strongly suggest drink as much as you want or eat as much of the leaves as you want uh, unless you have a blood clotting issue or you're taking medications that you're supposed to avoid vitamin K, um, which, you know, it, you just, um, I'm not going to say eat, eat it and eat it needed, but you do want to do some things in moderation. But, um, yeah, if you're having it for, on a daily basis, you should be fine unless you have that medical condition. Thistle. Thistle? Mm -hmm. Liver. Bull thistle? No. Milk, milk, milk thistle. thistle is very good for liver. Mm -hmm. It's in that same family. Uh, bull thistle, you can eat that. It also is good for your liver, the root. And one of my favorite that is kind of a class by itself, if you haven't, I almost hesitate um, to talk about it because it's very much drop dosage and you don't eat it, you only use a tincture, and that's poke root. Poke root's very good as a lymphatic, but if you don't know how to use it, let's wait just a little bit. I just want you to know the information when somebody says, oh, you can't, you can't do anything with that because it'll kill you. I just want you to know that I that I take it on a daily basis, <laughs> so, and I'm standing here in front of no. Um, yes. Uh, well, t yeah, I can do that. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. SEAC T. Um, SEAC T was the question. SEAC T is just Renee K spelled backwards. Okay, Renee K C A I S S E spelled backwards is SEAC. <clears throat> she made this this concoction and it has um, gosh I forgot I forgot what all's in it but the one that is just overtaking my yard is sheep sorrel root but I don't remember what's in there she got it from a Canadian Indian no she did she lied I wouldn't <laughs> say that I didn't say that so it's the root not the leaf of the, of the sheep sorrel it's the root Chaparral. I forgot what's in it. It's I, 
Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to take it and use it and it works for you, that's great. It's not something that I use, so I don't really talk about it that much. I can just, I could sell you a truckload of sheep sorrel if you want to do it. <laughs> I can bring it. To, if you want to come pick it, you can. All right, so um, we, I promised we were going to talk about inflammation. <clears throat> inflammation is the number one killer in the US and mostly it's because of our diet. The glyphosate, um, the poor nutrition in our diet, uh, even if you're using a, 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 um, a commercial seed uh, to, to grow your own food, our diet is just sorely lacking in nutrients. Um, so the number one thing that I would tell you for inflammation um, is to start taking a, um, a trace mineral, increase your nutrition. We've already talked about vitamin C being made from mold on corn. Um, so the trace minerals are going to help the nutrition. I'm going to talk for about 10 more minutes, and then I think it's lunch time. Lunch. Are you ready for lunch? OK, do what? 20 minutes? OK. Um, Nutrition, your body is not able to fight this inflammation uh, because of our nutrition. Just like a, a, uh, a, a cavity in your tooth, if you catch it in time, if your body has enough tr nutrition, it will heal that cavity before it turns into a cavity. It's going to just be a small spot on a tooth. If your body has enough nutrition, it's going to heal that because this happens multiple times a month or a year, whatever, these little... Uh, because your enamel is technically fluid, and when I say fluid, think of a piece of glass, very old glass. Have you ever noticed how the, it's, it's thicker on the bottom? A, a, a pane of glass will be thicker on the bottom than it will be on the top because technically it's fluid. Uh, there is a high melting point, but it still will, gra uh, gravity will eventually work. Well, your enamel is living tissue. Your body can heal that by taking minerals from other parts of your body to help heal that. When your body doesn't have enough or that hole goes, goes farther, that's when it turns into a cavity. So if your nutrition is good enough, your body's going to heal those. That's why some people will never get a cavity and have the same diet or eat the same amount of sugar as someone else. And that person gets a dozen cavities. It's the nutrition that your body can pull. Most women, after they have a baby, will have a dental issue within the first two years. I forgot where I read that study, but there's a lot of women after having a baby because they pull the nutrition to the baby and it'll pull it out of their teeth. It, it'll take it away from their teeth, I should say. So nutrition is number one, getting your diet back where it needs to be. Um, then number two, breads, grains, nightshades, um, tomatoes, these things that we have assumed for so many years were good. Five servings a day of fruit, inflammation has, I mean, excuse me, five servings a day of bread, inflammation has skyrocketed since they made that pyramid. Without bread, without grains in your diet, three days without, without uh, any, t any type of grain product in your diet, I give you three days and that inflammation will be better much better, significantly better. Hank, does it work? <laughs> the getting rid of grains. Okay, well, let me tell you a little story. Hank, he was get, getting to where, this was about the time I guess he turned 60, 62, something like that. He was getting where he couldn't move. Had joints that were just almost, I mean, he couldn't bend his knee, couldn't get down on his knees, couldn't do shoulders really bothering him. He had rotator cuff surgery, shoulders really bothering him. And I'm like, if you'll stop eating grains, didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to talk about it. This went on for months. Finally, one day at dinner, he didn't even look up. He was sitting there doing something in his mouth. I said, all right, what are you talking about? What, what is this about grains? I said, just try it for a week. No grains whatsoever. If it doesn't work, go back to eating grains. It's fine. Just try it. The third day, he called me. He said, you're not going to believe this, but I have no pain. 
It took him three days. No grains, no dairy, no tomatoes, no nightshades, which are potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, <clears throat> lots of onions, especially raw onions and raw garlic, not cooked, but raw garlic in salad dressings, things like that. I, I would just about bet you a nickel that your inflammation would be significantly reduced. So eat the onions and the garlic, but none of the other stuff. None of the other stuff. And it is so hard to find food that does not have whey in it. The wheat is subsidized by the government, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be, they're going to just practically give it away to get, to get whey, W-H-E-Y, in your food. And I've seen things um, like fermenting, Fermenting is another thing that will, will definitely help. Uh, cabbage, if you're fermenting cabbage for kraut, sauerkraut, kimchi, all of these other types of ferment, um, those probiotics are extremely beneficial for inflammation. Um, but I've seen companies where they'll sell you a starter to make your, to make your kimchi or your kraut or anything like that. It's whey. That's all it is, is whey. So you're putting that dairy and that grain into even a, even into, do what? It's bad for you. It's bad for you. Yeah. So um, if, you, if you get those few things done on your diet, your medic, you'll, you'll be able to, with the help of your doctor, you'll be able to lower your medications. Um, your systems will start working better. The inflammation will go away. Uh, and that's, you can have inflammation in your skin. I have inflammation now because, as I told you, I have reactions to things uh, that I put on my face. I can put very few things on my face uh, and I'm having a reaction. That's why I have on no makeup today. Uh, but your skin can have inflammation. Your gut has inflammation. Your joints and your bones. It's not just a swollen knee that's killing us. It's the, it's the inflammation all over our body. So changing our diets out. now. Uh, changing our diets out are going to significantly help. Now, some herbs that can help with that, if you will take care of the liver with those liver herbs that we were just talking about, the burdock, yellow dock, um, even bone set will help with the inflammation, not just in the lungs, but, but at other places in your body. Uh, the dandelion root, and all of these can be made into a tincture because the liver is a solid organ. It's not hollow, so you can take those as a tincture. You don't have to put those in tea. If you're eating those leaves, you want to get them before it sends up the stalk, before the dandelion shows up. You want to get the greens, or after the dandelion goes away, you want to get the leaves. Uh, the burdock, same thing. You can eat those burdock leaves when they're small and tasty, but when that plant bolts, when that plant sends up the flower or the stalk, that's when uh, it's going to be bitter. But what you're doing is, is increasing the bitter flavor uh, we don't have enough bitter in our diets now, so our body is not processing that, that uh, inflammation as well either. So something like Swedish bitters. I make a product called Southern Bitters that has all of these things in it that we were just talking about, plus things like gentian and a couple of other um, herbs that are very bitter tasting. Uh, so I make a, a Southern Bitters and we'll take that. <clears throat> but if you want to put a Swedish Bitters into your diet, the best way to take them is to drop it on your tongue, one or two drops. Do one drop to get used to it and be prepared with a little bit of water after you take it. Let it sit as long as you can because it's kind of bitter. <laughs> my mother, my mother is the world's worst. She can't stand anything bitter. So I can take her these things and she won't take them. Uh, compliancy is the, compliance is the key. Getting somebody to take it, getting children to take it. Elderly or invalid people just don't want to eat. So even getting them to take something like bitters is very hard. Uh, but you want that response of salivation. You want it to start and go through the entire gut. And it's going to help where that inflammation is. So Swedish bitters is a product that you can get in the grocery store, the liquor store, other places like that. Uh, but you want to get that bitter taste in your mouth. Uh, and then when you're taking those bitter herbs, um, there's a reason it's in the Bible, take the bitter herbs that was so they're, because they were having a fast meal on the run and the digestion was lacking.
can. Um, so they, they wanted it to keep the, keep the upset, the stomach upset down. Um, GSC, grapes, grapefruit seed extract, you know, like when you buy the bottle, it says not to take it, like drop it right in your tank because it diluted. But is it okay? I mean, if you can handle the bitterness. If it tells you not to do it, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, if you put it in just a sip of water and hold it in your mouth so that you feel those salivary glands working, um, that would be the same thing. The reason that they're telling you not to put it directly in your tongue is because it's hot. Uh, it would be hot. It would be, it might, it burn. yeah, it could burn uh, because it's really potent. So if you get a brand that tells you, if you buy Swedish bitters and it tells you not to drop it on your tongue, don't. <laughs> yeah, so put it in a little sip of water and hold that in your mouth. Uh, but when I make them, I make them where you can just drop it straight into your mouth, and that's and it and it gets the salivary glands to working. So yes, ma'am. When I take my grapefruit seed extract, I put it in a veggie cap and take it with a meal. It goes down the nose. Yeah. 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 How do you get? Do you know how that's extracted? That grapes, it's grapefruit seed or grape grapefruit seed? Do you know how that's extracted? No. Check into that. Grape seed and grapefruit seed. Some of them, I'm not going to say all of them, some of them are extracted with hexane. Uh, hexane. Okay. Hexane. It's a chemical that happens to cause cancer. Or, or with a high heat, grape seed oil is extracted with very high heat or hexane, which both are cancerous. Who knew, right? Check your grape seed and, and uh, grapefruit seed and make sure how it's extracted and you can usually find that information if you do a search uh, if it's extracted well don't it's not a problem but just like with um, vitamin C a lot or excuse me uh, vitamin B cyanocobalamin that's that's B cyanocobalamin cyano methylcobalamin is the good one so you know it just Isn't it amazing what they do to us? Just, yeah, your vitamin C. What did you say, dear? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. B12. So how do you want it to be extracted? With cold pressed? Cold pressed, which is expensive. So if you're getting a, a cut rate, um, like a pharmacy drug, uh, or uh, at the at the Rite Aid, or not Rite Aid, they're out of business, aren't they? Um, Walgreens, yeah, grocery store brands. You'll want to get a pharmaceutical grade supplement. St. John's Nutrition. I know Saint, I know Matt and Deborah St. John, wonderful people. I recommend them. Um, there's some others. Solar Ray is one that's local. Say that again, I'm sorry. What? St. John's is online. Mm -hmm. St. John's Nutrition is online. And I think it's stjohnsnutrition.com. Don't hold me to that. But if you'll look up Matt St. John or just St. John's Nutrition and Google that, you'll find it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I didn't know there was a difference. I've never heard of black castor oil. Not when they roast the castor beans. So it gives it a black color. It's really hot. It's a darker color. So I don't know if that roasting is actually beans. Some people say it's like more beneficial because it roasts the castor That's, that's um, I need to look into that. Yeah, Dean. Um, I'm from Haiti, and I guess this is probably the only thing we use a lot is castor oil. It's castor oil? So my mom used to... Um, Toast it, and then you grind it, and then you extract the oil. And some other people, you will, you, you will dry it, and then cold press to get the oil. The cold press oil will come very light, and the other one will be black. Interesting. So both of them, they do great. great mm -hmm. I recently heard you use that for oil pulling. Mm -hmm. For oil pulling casserole. That's a good one, too. I'll need to check into both of those. <laughs> Didn't like it. All right, castor oil packs. Um, you said that this nice lady was telling me that she was um, using a pack on her, on her knee. Um, castor oil 
will draw out impurities. So when you make a castor oil pack, and if anybody has ever seen Barbara O'Neill on, on the internet, oh, she was here. <gasps> really? Oh, I wish I had known that. <laughs> I would love to meet her. I think she's wonderful. She does a castor oil. She tells you how to do a castor oil plaster. Uh, and that's where you just lay down a, a sheet of, of cloth, like a, a linen or something, and put the castor oil on it and lay another layer down and put more castor oil until you have a, a nice little pad. And to put it like on liver or um, different issues that you're using it for, but you can put that castor oil on the knee and it will help draw out some of that. Um, another one that I would suggest for pain, um, if you have, where's Kent? Tell them what devil's, devil's walking stick looks like. Well, looks like it's from the devil, don't you? Exactly. Trump has very big thorns all over it. Okay. Yeah, it does. It's a jointed plant, meaning if you look at it, it looks like joints like this. Well, between the joints, there's spikes. Mm -hmm. Where is that going to hurt? I mean, was that a, a doctrine of signatures? What is that and tell you that it's got an affinity for? Joints. See where those spikes are coming out between the two joints? That's devil's walking stick. And it never fails where you're going hiking and you reach to grab a sapling as you're going down a little hill. It's going to be a devil's walking stick. So <laughs> devil's walking stick is wonderful for joint pain. And I will use that and I would suggest to you to start with poke berries. No, they're not going to kill you. Toxicity is in the dose. Anything is poisonous. Anything is toxic. Water is toxic. If you, if you drink enough, if you drown in it, it's toxic, isn't it? <laughs> um, but if you're taking the berries, if you, when, the, when the plant ripens very soon, in a couple months, it's going to be probably July, uh, mid-July in my area, uh, and I'm pretty, what, what's your elevation here? 16. Okay, well, I'm at 3,000, and mine is in July, so yours may be June. <clears throat> but if you'll take the, the berries and freeze those, you can keep them all winter. It's a wonderful lymphatic. Now, I suggest people to start out with three berries, and you want to swallow those whole. Uh, or, or you can mince them up in your mouth, but just don't swallow or don't chew the seed. Swallow the whole berry, the seed, and everything. Just don't break into the seed. The seed has a coating that is very good for digestion, very good to help drain lymph, and extremely good for the inflammation that's causing joint pain. And that's arthritis, that's uh, swelling from, from injury, any of those things. It has the affinity for that. Take three. The next day, take four. And the next day, take five. And keep going like that until you start feeling a little bit of a purge, meaning you have to go a little to the bathroom a little too often. That's where your toxicity level is, back, back down. And I didn't say poisonous. I said toxicity, meaning you're having too much of a flush. Okay? Your body is going to flush and purge itself when you get too much toxin. But at that therapeutic dose, of three berries and then four berries. Most people I know can take nine berries a day after they build up. Some people may only need one berry. Then you might need three berries. Everybody in here is different. And you may not need it every day once you reach that level where your diet is better, you're taking care of your liver, and your inflammation is going down. So you may not need that every day. I don't need it every day. I wind up taking it about twice a week. So I'll take three. If I'm in a lot of pain, if all of a sudden it's a day like today and my body hurts, my joint, I have overworked my joints and I can tell I'm just inflamed, I might go ahead and take nine, but I know what my body will do. I'll know if I'm going to purge or not. So I know my body well enough and I've taken it long enough that nine doesn't hurt me. Hank couldn't get near nine. He would take three. Um, and I also tincture this, and for convenience, I'll take it tinctured with the seeds, and I'll take it for convenience like that. But for you, I would suggest going and getting the berries. You can freeze the droops. 
that grows on a droop like a like a grape freeze those in a in a ziploc bag i'll lay them on a tray till they freeze and i'll put them in a ziploc bag you can dehydrate them as well yeah you don't have to freeze them uh, but you want the seed in the berry the berry is just a carrier and it's purple so your grandma told you not to eat it because you'd be purple all over you know and yes somebody will always say i know i got a cousin who had their stomach pumped back in the 70s that was because your grandma didn't know what you ate and the doctor didn't know either and they were going to teach you a lesson and they had they had to take precautions so your stomach was pumped because they didn't know what you were eating my grandmother ate she i grew up on pokeberry jam i didn't like it unless she mixed it with muscadines so i didn't like just plain pokeberry jam and i had i had poke salad multiple times a week. I still eat poke salad all the time. I grew up on nightshade jam. The purple, the, when they turned purple. Really? And nightshade pie. I knew you could eat it, but I just never have. <clears throat> so, take anyway. The seeds when, you're making jam. when you make jam, you do take out the seeds, but she would cook them. She would cook them and then strain out the seeds so that coating was dissolving into the jam as well. So we would eat it, and once in a while I would notice I gotta go to the bathroom more than I normally would after I'd go to my grandmother's and eat pokeberry jam because I was getting a little, you know, a good dose, uh, which was fine. Your body needs to purge anyway, right? You get castor oil or Fletcher's castoria, things like that in the spring. Well, those greens were part of the spring flush uh, poke salad kept a lot of people alive during the depression especially in the south so it was a staple on a lot of tables and it's a delicious green but it needs respect you have to respect it and you may have heard stories that you have to boil it three times no if you are well let me say not not let me say no here's how I do it if the leaf is less than the size of my hand this big or smaller I only boil them one time. The shoots, when they're less than 10 inches tall or so, they don't have to be boiled. You can just treat them like you would asparagus. Saute them in a pan, chop them up, put them in whatever dish. Um, but you want to boil your leaves that are less than your hand one time. And that means you bring your water to a boil, put your leaves in it. It's going to cool the water, so bring it back to a boil for one minute drain that water off and taste the leaf if it's still bitter like a larger leaf will be bitter more bitter than that smaller leaf mm -hmm. but I usually just do one boiling and they taste great and then I'll make my my poke salad casserole or poke salad and scrambled eggs with ramps or or whatever you're gonna eat it with however you're gonna eat it jerked greens do you have a good recipe for jerked greens how do you how do you eat greens in Haiti do you have a good recipe? Oh. Just we don't have recipe. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't go. Oh, I, I got you. Okay. Later on, I've learned. I'll oh learn. yeah. Well, anyway, you eat greens if you like them sautéed, if you like them stir fried, if you like them uh, jerked, which I do, which is a little bit spicy and sweet, almost like a sweet and sour. Uh, however, you're going to eat them in a collard casserole, things like that. Your greens are ready after that first boil. Now, if you get leaves that are about this big. You're going to have to boil them twice, and that's for one minute. And I, I wouldn't get any leaves this big unless I was really hungry because there's plenty of leaves this big on the plant. Even when there are leaves this big, if you look, you can get a whole mess of small leaves um, from that same plant that's got big leaves on it. <clears throat> And then they're ready to make in whatever recipe, just like you were using spin raw spinach. At that point, you've taken the toxin out, and that's called phytolycotoxin because the plant is Phytolyca americana. That's the plant. The toxin is a water-soluble toxin called phytolycotoxin. And so the water-soluble means that you're going to boil it out. So that one boiling will do it. If they're larger leaves and it has a lot more of the phytolycotoxin in it, you may have to boil them twice for that one minute. But I never get greens that are that big. I always go this size or smaller and, and have them tastier. For the phytolycotoxin, do you know if there's any beneficial uses like in the garden setting as an insecticide or preventative? You know, we're not going to eat it, might as well get rid of it. But could you, are there other applications that are necessary? It's very good insecticide. It's a very good insecticide. It's got saponins in it. 
uh, certain saponins you can't eat to a point. Um, other saponins you can't. And um, Yeah, it'll wash it away. It won't take it. I mean, it won't dissolve it, but it would wash it away off your plants. So if you're using it as an insecticide, you want to spray your soil, spray under the leaves of your plants, the fruit and everything is fine. It'll wash away. Yeah, when you wash the fruit. So yeah, it's a great. Beauty berry is another insecticide. Beauty berry. And it grows native here. I told him to say. The boy water, will it also kill Hmm. Aphids, maybe. The bet I find a better, uh, what I like better for aphids and June bugs and anything like that is is fermented garlic water. Um, three cloves of gar or three bulbs, whole bulbs chopped up of garlic, a couple of big onions chopped up, peel and all. Put it in a five-gallon bucket of water and put it out in the sun and let it sit till it's nasty, nasty fermented. And then you'll take and use that as a tea. Fill up your um, watering jug. Put about two cups in, in your watering jug and fill it up with water and, and put that everywhere. I grow garlic in everything except beans and peas. And it'll keep away June bugs off of your, uh, your blackberries and raspberries and roses. If you grow garlic in amongst your roses, you won't have a June bug problem. You had a... <coughs> Pogue salad is a blood purifier. It's a lymphatic, meaning it's going to help help dispose of lymph. Uh, if you if you ever get the the little bit of soreness under your jaw, even when you're not sick, you know, oh, all of a sudden I have a knot there for some reason. It's not. My mother used to say, oh, that's a salivary gland. It's just no, that's your that's your lymph glands. And a lymphatic massage. If you've ever done lymphatic, I see you doing that. I do that all the time. Lymphatic massage. I'm driving down the road, and here I sit doing this. Lymphatic massage. I look it up on YouTube, and you'll be able to find a really good one. There's dozens of of uh, videos on that, uh, but. Poke salad is a very good lymphatic, will help that lymph move. That's going to help with inflammation all over your body because your lymph chain follows your circulatory system. So. Does it have oxalic acid in it? Oxalic acid, probably a little, a little, but nowhere near as much as wood sorrel, which is oxalis. Wood sorrel and sheep sorrel have a lot more. Lamb's quarter has a lot more, and I love all those. And oxalic acid is not going to be that much of an issue unless you have kidney stones. So that's a forming building block of kidney stones. So if you have a kidney stone issue, you want to lay off of anything that has high in oxalic acid. What do you do for kidney stones? Joe Pieweed. Joe, Joe Pieweed. Sting and nettle, Joe Pieweed. Yep. Look that one up, learn it, it's the root. Um, that's a specific medicine, but it's also very good for kidneys. Did you have a question? How long you? Did you supposed to boil the leaf for you, say, um, poke leaf? To boil the poke leaf, to get rid of the phytolacotoxin is for about one minute. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, just bring it to a bowl and let it boil for a minute and drain it. And then you've got the greens, drained greens, and they're ready to do whatever. The, the most common way is to just scramble them with eggs, scrambled eggs. You mentioned lamb's quarter. Oh, I love lamb's quarter. Genopodium. Can you use it raw, or you cook it, and which is the benefits of it? A friend of mine who's a foraging uh, expert, she uses it raw. To me, if I take it, I have put it in a smoothie. I'm not a big fan of smoothies, so strike one right there. Uh, but I put it in a smoothie, and it just made my throat so raw. But I have an affinity for issues with my throat, as you can tell. I had a um, throat injury. I used to be a singer. I can't sing anymore. Uh, I can hardly talk at times, especially to project. I can't project my voice anymore because I had a throat injury. Uh, so it immediately, it felt like I had just... I don't, I don't know, it was just real scratchy and raw in my throat. So I don't eat it raw. That doesn't mean you can't eat it raw. Uh, it could be eaten raw, but usually oxalic acid, you can neutralize that if you cook it. She puts it in a pesto. Uh, I, I wouldn't use it in a pesto, but I would use daylily leaves or stinging nettle raw. I would use uh, wood sorrel raw, lemon balm raw, all of those that have some oxalic acid but just not lamb's quarters. Everybody familiar with lamb's quarter? Yeah. 
<clears throat> it is. And you're not going to kill that vitamin C if you're steaming it or boiling it uh, or sauteing it. Yeah. I like it just, I'll just take and put it raw in the pan with a little bit of bacon fat. If you eat bacon, if you don't eat bacon, use something else. But a little bit of bacon and, and saute them for a minute. And my favorite way is to put a little uh, chicken broth in there and let them simmer for a few minutes. And by the time the chicken broth dries, I can scramble my egg in there or just pour my scrambled egg in and saute that. That's in the book, by the way. That's in the new book coming out next month. 